I just found this baby in there, like <laughs> chilling with the adults. I'm, like I, I, I was walking by and I see Sappy, which is the female, and she's very bold now for a red eye crocodile, for excuse me, red eye crocodile skin. And there's yeah, this little flash of orange beside her, like it darted back. I was like, wait, what? So I go in with like my iPhone light. I just, just kind of gently shine it down under the wood and I can see it's like head there. I'm like, oh my gosh, like they hatched a baby like in the enclosure. Like, I, so yeah, we worked out a deal and everything. And so the thing is, yes, you mentioned they're so rare. Um, he got them, I don't know, it must've been like maybe two or three years before they were listed to CITES 1, which is necessary, but unfortunate. It makes it so hard to get more or anything. Do you mind telling us how much you paid for them? I don't mind. Welcome to episode number 94 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you so much for tuning in today. So today I'm speaking with Dion Solani, who is the creator of the YouTube channel Reptiliatus. Reptiliatus is a very popular Canadian YouTube channel that passed 100,000 subscribers earlier this year. Now in the episode, of course, we discuss how Dion got into specialty pet keeping in the first place, but really we spent a good amount of time focusing on introducing and using wild-caught animals for breeding projects in captivity. We discuss how important it is that if we are importing wild-caught animals that those animals are being used in captive breeding programs and how really it's sort of pointless to have a wild-caught animal like a wild-caught toke gecko end up at PetSmart and be sold to you know a kid for $20. In that way we're really not helping the wild populations of these animals and if we are going to be importing wild caught animals they do need to be or they should be participating in captive breeding programs and that's exactly what we discussed today especially with two of Dion's projects specifically his red-eyed crocodile skinks and his shinisaurus which is the Chinese crocodile lizards both breeding breeding projects are well underway and it is incredibly exciting and Dion really laid out the details for both of those projects and Dion also has a pair of Varanus prasinus which is the emerald tree monitor so he talks about how he works with that species and how he's implemented some training programs with them and we also cover his Europlatus fantasticus breeding project which is the satanic leaf tail gecko because he's actually taken that project and he's downgraded it from a complete bioactive setups all the way back down to something that's a little more sterile and manageable so we discuss why he did that and the success that he's now having with those setups you know we've talked about on the podcast before Bioactivity is not always the gold standard and sometimes it can overcomplicate things. So he talks about that process and why what's working for him now is working. And we wrap up the conversation with his YouTube channel. Dion's actually been on YouTube with Reptiliatus from I think 12 years now. So he talks about how it's progressed, why he started it, how it's progressed over time and where his plans are for the future. So before we jump into the episode, let's do our housekeeping real quick. If you enjoyed the episode and you're looking for more information on it, head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you will find links to the show notes. In the show notes, I have a sort of a breakdown of each episode and they include links of things discussed in the episode. So there's where you're going to want to go if you want more information for something discussed. You can also find links to the shop on there where you can buy yourself an Animals at Home t-shirt or $5 does automatically get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the YouTube description as well as the show notes. If you're in the market for a new reptile cage, I highly recommend going to check them out. Of course, if you do make a purchase, a small commission will come back to me at no extra cost to you. And if you do want early access to episodes as well as the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests, make sure you join us on Patreon at Patreon.com slash Animals at Home. All right, let's jump into today's episode. Enjoy. Dion, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you for having me. I've been really excited about having the opportunity to come on here. Yeah, well, it's always great to talk to another Canadian. And obviously, your channel has been doing so well over the past few years. You just hit 100,000 subscribers and you're, you know, you blew past 100,000 subscribers. So congrats on that. And we'll get into that. But one thing I wanted to start with initially is I noticed that you start using the term specialty pets instead of exotic pets and I was wondering if there was if there was some intention behind that and if there was what what was that yeah so 
I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, we can acknowledge and and then both agree that like, yes, in some ways, these animals are exotic in nature. But I've had a few conversations with other Canadians about kind of changing or at least using another form of language to address the animals. Just because, unfortunately, whenever it comes to anything negative about the animals, the association is always exotic. And I find that there's also a lot of, if I'm not mistaken, social media platforms that kind of flag the word exotic too. Mm. I think Facebook's doing this. I could be wrong. Um, But I mean, that's also by association of other things that are considered exotic. So I'm using that language. And sometimes I still say exotic, but to kind of create I guess a different way of addressing the animals because the reality is most of the animals or at least quite a few of them we're working with they're not they're not like for example all wild caught Mm -hmm. there's many animals that really are as do I say well not domesticated but like have been bred in captivity as regularly as say hamsters even more so than many types of tropical fish and I kind of want to change the language because when people say exotic, we just automatically assume that it's this like wild animal sometimes that's like super savage or who knows what, maybe aggressive, dangerous. And when you look at like a bearded dragon, how many generations is that bred in captivity, a crested gecko? And yes, there is some representation, the hobby of animals that are sort of new and every animal that's found its way into, let's say the pet trade or being kept in captivity originated from wild caught animals and that's a whole topic on its own i suppose but yeah i use the topic or i use the the, like i use specialty pets because i just think that that language like sure specialty could insinuate that it's sort of like a more challenging animal to care for and sometimes or in some cases that is true but i think it just kind of yeah it changes the language or at least creates more language around instead of always like exotic pet you think of like um, you know, tigers and, and things mm-hmm. like that. And, and I mean, that that's, again, a whole other thing as well. But um, I think that that can be hopefully a helpful thing in adding more language to when we discuss, like, keeping reptiles, amphibians, invertebrates and other things like that. So yeah, well, well, that kind of makes sense. But. No, it, it totally makes sense. And it's funny because I had a conversation with another Canadian keeper as well. Maybe we were talking to the same person. This is more of a recent conversation and it was the, sort of the same thing is mm. the term exotic has sort of been taken on by other parties. The animal rights groups love that term. And mm-hmm. you're right, it does have this, it gives you this weird image that it's just like taking from the wild and it's exotic and it's like mystical. And you think of like Miami in the 70s where everybody had exotic <laughs> animals and, and it's not the right image. So I... I was having this conversation then I started watching more of your videos and all of a sudden I started hearing you say specialty and I'm like, I wonder if, if that was a, an intentional change. And I think it, it makes sense. It, it is, and they are specialty pets and we do want to separate them from that, you know, crazy wild caught market. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the only concern I've ever had with that terminology, but I feel like it's still fairly appropriate is, is like, I, I don't, yeah, I mean, you could say, you could have an argument or discussion about what's more challenging to keep a dog or a certain type of reptile. And I would argue in some cases, some of the specialty pets are more easy to keep than a oh, dog, yeah. considering the commitment and attention and everything a dog requires, training, you name it. Um, I worry because those are like specialty pets, like, oh, you can only keep these if you have like a set of specific skills. But we do want to create some form of distinction, but it's trying to do it without taking the negative connotation yes. that's unfortunately started to become associated with the word exotic, I think. So. Yeah, it's, it is weird because, I mean, this is very similar to the conversation I was having with this other keeper is we're looking for a better word and specialty is maybe it doesn't fit perfect, but it's kind of as good as it gets right now. Maybe eventually we'll yeah. come up with something better, but for now I think it works fine. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I mean, we're constantly evolving in every aspect of the hobby, so I'm fine changing it up when it <laughs> exactly. becomes a good we'll come up with a better word. Let's do it. So tell exactly. me about your journey with specialty pets. How, how, what yeah. drew you to them initially? Yeah. So, I mean, I always say this, it's like the cheesy story of being a small child, honestly, for, for as long as I can remember, I've always had this passion and love for reptiles specifically and i think as a child there was also that really like immense fascination with dinosaurs i mean as a small child growing up and like 
the nineties, I had so many Jurassic park toys and <laughs> I was playing with dinosaurs. Uh, I'd want to see every dinosaur movie, like, you know, and, um, I'd watch different TV shows and I'd go to my local library and rent with my mom, uh, some of the like videotapes of national geographic and just watch documentaries on reptiles and amphibians. And yeah, I mean, honestly, it's just this, like, do I call it an innate love for the animals? Uh, it's just always been there. And I think as far as keeping the specialty pet goes, um, I, I was very fortunate to grow up in a household that, my parents, and I've discussed this in brief in some of my content, uh, were very supportive and enabled me to explore that love and passion. So, I mean, as a young child, I grew up with like a fish tank. At a certain point, I kept my first lizard. It was a bearded dragon named Kovu, <laughs> the Lion King. And we found out she was a female, but that's fine. <laughs> Classic happens and, with reptiles all the time. Exactly, right? Um, and then I think where I started developing like an interest in breeding that came from the encouragement. I think of a friend or two in high school, we uh, were breeding crested geckos. And I think after it must've been like literally the moment I produced my first crested gecko, um, it was just such a, not to be too cheesy, but like magical experience to have, you know, successfully raise these animals that you have an immense love for and appreciation for and like learning about and observing and then being able to like successfully have them reproduce and seeing that little offspring mm -hmm. emerge from the egg. There's something really, I don't know, not even mysterious, but just really magical about that. And um, I wouldn't call myself like a breeder or anything, because, uh, you know, a lot of people will message me and be like, oh, where's your website that you sell all your animals on? And it's like, well, to be honest, like, I'm not trying to really do that. I have my projects and things that I really enjoy. Um, and I mean, well, I guess we'll get into that. But I, I, I do it out of love for the animals. And I think there's a certain level of fulfillment you get from being able to reproduce the animals. Sure, there's like elements of maybe stress and other things that you have to watch out for with breeding the animals too but it's sort of like the full circle experience mm -hmm. especially for some of the species i keep that aren't always as common um but yeah like uh i don't know i just yeah I've, I've started wanting to get into keeping more species and learning about how to keep them properly because i'm a firm believer that it's it's a continuous learning process and growth process that we're constantly evolving the way we keep the animals and looking for the next best way to do it. It's never like, this is the only way. And I mean, we know that too, because there's always more than one right way to keep an animal, but we always should be telling ourselves, like, there's going to be something down the road that we can learn about that'll further improve the way we keep the animal, especially since reptiles are so good at surviving, even when they're not necessarily thriving. Right. So it's not an illusion per se, but yeah. So I don't know, for me, it's just been, there's that passion and then it's driven by this opportunity here to learn about the animals in your home. And I think when you're breeding them too, it's like, it's just an extra sense of fulfillment, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does. And I, I want to get more detailed into your breeding in a second, but there's something I just thought of as you're talking about this, you know, there are a lot, I've never bred reptiles. It's something that eventually one day I, mm -hmm. I would like to maybe try, but there are obviously a lot of people that do breed. And I would say there's a lot of people that breed. I don't want to say the wrong species, but we have too many people breeding certain species. We can put mm -hmm. it that way. And I think partly that's probably due to that just amazing feeling you get when you breed, right? Like you're describing this, this full circle experience when it comes out of the egg, you're just, you can't believe how exciting that is. And that feeling you probably want to continue to replicate. And so what I love about what you're doing is you're working with different species and we're going to get into that in a little bit, but I could see why breeding could somewhat become a little bit addictive to people because mm -hmm. of that feeling and you're wanting to replicate that feeling. So I'm always talking about maybe we could people who love that feeling, maybe we could shift them over to different species so we can have more species diversity. But do you think that that is one of the, the, uh, do you think there is an element of addiction in, in, in keeping and breeding reptiles? I definitely think there can be. And I, that's one of the things I, I think, I mean, it's hard to say that that's what I'm doing with the amount of animals I keep, but like, uh, I think moderation is always important. Like mm -hmm. for me, I, I really 
ensure that I don't exceed my limits of what I'm capable of caring for because I'm, I'm a one man team. And yeah, like I've expanded, um, the amount of animals I keep, I try to avoid using the word collection because, you know, they're not trading cards, they're animals. Right. But, um, it's another word that we don't have a good replacement for. Yeah. (laughs) When you speak of that, (laughs) but, uh, yeah, like, I mean, I, I've i kind of grown the amount of animals I'm keeping since I've started doing the YouTube thing, which we'll again discuss like full time. Uh, so it's allowed me to have all that extra time. You know, it's 40 extra hours that I'm not working, doing something else that I can focus on the animal care and attention. But uh, as far as, sorry, uh, answering your question, like, sure, it's a magical feeling. I mean, I don't know. For me, it's not necessarily that. Like, I have a lot of other motives behind why I breed for me. It's very much so what you're addressing. Like a lot of the species I'm working with are a lot less common and don't really have captive representation in the hobby. So that's kind of the drive behind a lot of my projects. Some of the animals that I'm reproducing. And again, I know you want to address this, so I won't like talk about it too much, but are also just animals that uh, I, I very much love reproducing, but uh, they sort of help, fund and make everything more sustainable in the meantime as well so they're like popular species that i know that there's a strong market for that i'm producing to help offset the cost of everything else if that makes sense so yeah no that makes perfect sense so before we get into the breeding just one thing that i find interesting about the animals that you keep is you and you can kind of let us know what what are some of the species you keep but they are sort of i wouldn't say strange or anything but more unique because we have those staple you know the crested geckos i know you keep those as well but the 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 classics crested gecko corn snake ball python bearded dragon those things but your collection does have a a different tilt to it have you always been drawn to different things or 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 is that just something that you built on over time yeah um so i mean if i can say like i mean i i think i started off keeping all the the more common popular species. So like I, as I or I may not have mentioned that my first reptile was a bearded dragon, but funny enough, before that I was keeping fire belly toads. And, um, then I think I, yeah, as I mentioned, I got into keeping crested geckos and bred those for a bit. And that really ignited that love or interest in like, wow, like breeding the animals would be cool. And it's not to say that everything I've ever kept, I've wanted to breed either, but, um, I don't know, like my, I haven't always kept rare, rare animals, but I think part of it was like seeing that there's some representation of certain species in the hobby. And unfortunately for some of them, they are really just fed or I guess available through wild caught imports. Mm -hmm. And so it was sort of like, well, what is this? I mean, I really think that animal is incredible, but if I'm going to keep it, I'd like to be able to really learn about it and uh, associate myself with and, and develop friendships or connections with people around the world uh, using tools like social media to see who is successfully keeping these animals and make sure that I'm doing the same. Because I, for one, am a fairly firm believer that if an animal is coming into the trade from the wild, I feel that it's sacrifice, so to say, should yeah. be that uh, because, you know, made it this far, it should go into the hands of someone who is going to systematically uh, attempt to reproduce the animal in captivity. I really don't like the idea of wild caught animals coming into any sort of pet trade and becoming individual pets. And, you know, the argument that it's wrong for animals to come out of the wild, like conservation is a whole thing for sure. But uh, we know that whether it's fish and other things, animals come into the wild or come come into captivity from the wild, I should say. Um, But everything started that way, you know, whether it was a Syrian hamster or a goldfish that's very easy to breed in captivity. It's about what we do with those animals once they've come into captivity. And we have to really, like you said, like encourage each other that, you know, whether it's having that love for breeding or whatever it is, like we need to be breeding these animals and not just keeping them as single individual pets. Like that's such a shame to do it that way. So for me, um, I think I just started becoming really interested in some of those species that I'm only seeing like imported. For example, the red-eyed crocodile skinks. Like they're mm-hmm. such a vi- like very unique and um, fascinating looking animal. But 
they're predominantly available in the trade as wild caught animals coming out of Indonesia. So I ended up having a pair of them at a certain point, acquiring a pair of them through a, a reptile show I went to. And they did really well for me. Like they produce a few offspring a year and I have them set up a certain way and it's working very well. It's quite functional. And uh, one of the amazing things about their biology is the way they actually let their young live with them for mm -hmm. quite some time. And I know that there are people that choose not to do that, but my experience has been that it's very successful. I have offspring living with their parents that are over two years old and wow. haven't reached sexual maturity. And they're completely like, there's an amicable relationship there. Very minimal food competition um as super neat but then you're like well what is happening to all these animals that are coming into the trade so a lot of my projects are like very systematic that i i want to try and contribute to systematically i'm saying that a lot there but uh <laughs> you know reproducing the animals in captivity and then also helping by using my platform to show that process to encourage others and also help anyone else who has that same interest. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that it makes a lot of sense. And I think that's exactly right. So can you list through a few of the species that you keep? So just paint a picture yeah. for those that don't know. Yeah, yeah. no, for sure. So, uh, I mean, I have your more common, uh, the crested geckos and I have a few females and, uh, I have, uh, toke geckos that I keep and breed. I also keep my, uh, red eyed crocodile skinks, I keep, I used to keep quite a few species of the Europlatus or leaf tail geckos, but I now I'm solely keeping the Fantasticus, the satanic leaf tail geckos. I also have uh, my Shinisaurus, the uh, Chinese crocodile lizards, which are really special. I mean, all of them are special, but it's a really unique and special uh, privilege to have those three animals. And where do I also I go? I have my uh, solo little dude, E.T. is a Geomida spengleri. It's the mm -hmm. Vietnamese black-breasted leaf turtle. I have uh, Sierra, which is my Mexican black king snakes, just a juvenile female. And then I keep quite a few dendro baits and uh, other dart frog species. So I have uh, two species of, uh, or two localities rather, of uh, Tinctorius, uh, the dendro baitis truncatus, few of the uh, Fantismal, the Santa Isabella dire frogs, a pair of uh, blue jeans, Pumilio, the Ufaga Pumilios out of uh, Nicaragua. Uh, where else am I going with this? Who am I missing? I Did you like mention I'm the like... monitors? And of course, yes, thank you. So, and then, yeah, I have my Varanus Prasinus, the green tree monitors. So I have a pair of those animals, just both juveniles from uh, Canadian cold boys. Yeah, so you have a very eclectic group of animals there, which is great. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we'll, we'll jump into the breathing, but but even with toke geckos, for example, as far yeah. as I know, in Canada anyway, it seems like a lot of the toke geckos were wild caught. I see them in Petland and PetSmart all the time. I think there may have been some CITES changes. I'm not exactly sure if, if that's made an impact, but maybe you could talk about that. But even breeding those is, even though they're a common species, that is a rare captive bred animal. Yeah. So again, I mean, that gets into the, do I call it politics of breeding and supply and demand issues? Like part of the reality is, and it's, again, it's tricky because a lot, this is, I think involves or pertains, how do I say it, it addresses more people that breed as a living. I think that there's lack of motivation to breed an animal that is commonly brought in from the wild because it's very hard to compete with the prices. Exactly. So people lose motivation to breed species because it's an investment, of course. And oftentimes the way you go about it, you're not always even breaking even depending on what kind of animal it is, right? So, or you have to have a certain amount to start actually making a profit. And if that's what your motivation is, then sure, you're not interested in doing that. Unfortunately, slash fortunately, uh, it's weird because, you know, the way supply and demand works, like when there's a certain rarity thrown into the mix, and CITES tends to do that, people gain interest because it's like, oh, are we going to lose this species now or are they going to become harder to keep? And if I'm not mistaken, I think the tokes went to CITES 2 is what they were listed or reclassified under like a year or two ago, two years ago. I think it was at the end of 2019 or so that it happened. Um, right before everything <laughs> changed. Yeah, exactly. uh, yeah, so, I mean, regardless of that, I, I will say I, I'm aware of, several Canadian hobbyists that are breeding tokes, which is so nice to see in here. And I do know a few, um, but uh, yeah, like, is it, 
yeah, it's an interesting point. Like they're, they're uh, fairly common, but I think it also has to do with their sort of more defensive temperament in nature. And that's a whole other thing that I kind of do. I'm not saying I'm like some magical guru, Dr. Doolittle, but I do try and like condition the animals a bit to be more tolerant of interacting to whatever level they're interested in interacting me, interacting with me. Well, are the, uh, do you find that the captive bit born babies are a little bit softer when it comes to their temperament or are they just the just same as sort of a defensive aggressive behavior as a classic toke? So I think it depends on the level of interaction you um, you go for in the sense of like your effort and, and what you put into it. So for me, at a certain point, my goal was to raise hand tame tokes, but I got very busy with my move and other things. And I just was like, that's not the priority. My, the animals are healthy. They're happy. That's cool. So I can say with a certain level of confidence that the offspring I still have from my first pairing, um, they're very tolerant of tong feeding and they'll come to, like even out of the enclosure for food. But when it comes to actual handling, very similar disposition to say whatever your typical toke, like heck no, lots of vocalization, yeah. tempting to bite or run away. Uh, had I put in the effort to kind of handle the animals or, or make that a more positive experience, I think I really do feel they would have come around. My adult male Tiki, he will like cautiously, but he's happy to climb onto my arm for um, like a super worm or something that he'd like to eat. So I have gotten a lot of them to the point where they're, I guess, desensitized enough or conditioned to know that like nothing dangerous will happen if they come onto my body like my hand or arm for prey and i mean that's already pretty cool they're doing it like out of their own decision or will uh, free will to decide i'm uh, not like forcing the interaction and i think that also um, says a lot about why it works well mm -hmm. uh, but yeah i i know like i've seen for a fact like i've seen um even other canadian hobbyists that have raised fairly hand tamed toke geckos and they're just like mossing on their hand or their arm or whatever not biting or anything and it's really cool to see uh, but i do think it takes a lot of effort it's yeah. not something that just like happens out of nowhere like they're putting work in to get that relationship out of the animal well they are such a nice looking species and they're a large robust animal oh, yeah. it'd be nice if they were yeah. i mean they are very popular but like we said it's just not not ideal that we're just poaching from the wild to you know for them to get because i remember the first time i saw one in petland it was super cheap. It was like $20 and I couldn't believe yeah. it. I was like, Oh, I love Tokyo geckos. They're so cool. But it was, then I realized, yeah, it's because it's just been ripped out of the wild and who knows that's why this gecko is so angry, but let's jump into some of your more complex breeding projects. Maybe we'll start with the, with the red eyed croc skinks because like you'd already started to mention them. So maybe you could just lay out, you said you, you already had some sort of breeding and, but you've expanded that project since then. Yeah. So uh, as I was discussing, so I've had, my original pair of red eye crocodile skinks, I want to say since like, I think 2017 in the falls when I purchased them uh, from Tails and Scales, actually at a reptile show. And they were very like clear that these were wild caught imports. And so I purchased the two animals. And um, I mean, I did some research from what I could find and joined a few Facebook groups and everything. And um, I ended up housing them in it's funny because I know a lot of people suggested like really large enclosures, but I found that they were like so shy. I, I decided to house them in like a 15 gallon long uh, enclosure and um, create like a paludarium sort of setup. So I knew that the animals enjoyed spending time in water because initially I was housing them in an enclosure that had like a large water dish and I'd always catch them bathing in it and then bolting into the hide once they saw me kind of thing. So I was like, okay, well, how do I do this in a better fashion that gives them more water space, um, offers them, I'm going to keep looking this way because I'm looking at the enclosures. They're just over there, offers them a filtration, you know, more mechanical filtration to keep the water clean and everything longer. Uh, so I, yeah, I created like a slope and a barrier, but then I made my drainage layer part of the, I guess, mechanical filtration, offering more porous space for beneficial bacteria to colonize uh, the hydroton and other things. And uh, yeah, so I had the pair go in there. I planted it heavy with pothos so they could store some of the nitrates and everything. And um, 
yeah, I think it, it took like maybe a year. Like my goal was, I was, I was definitely very optimistic that at some point they might breed. But the funny thing is I remember is that I had the animals for at least a year before I suddenly found an egg in the enclosure. And it was just like, wow, that's cool. And the first egg that they gave me, I actually removed from the enclosure and decided to incubate uh, manually myself. And after the incubation period, that animal hatched, but unfortunately it had, I guess, prolapsed an organ of some sort. I don't know what, and it wasn't like, you know, I'm not like novice here. It wasn't just like the yolk still attached to the, 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 the abdomen or anything. It was like, there was something protruding and it was, it was terrible. It passed maybe within a few hours of being born, unfortunately. And then the second time, so I knew I should also add, sorry, um, these animals generally speaking. So the female has one functioning ovary, which is very interesting. So they don't lay like two eggs at a time or more. It's one egg at a time. And generally speaking, they're, they'll lay an egg. And by the time that first animal has hatched from the egg, uh, the female's ovulation cycle has got her to a point where she's going to lay the second egg. So usually every like 75 to 90 days, when the female is, is reproducing, she'll lay an egg. And so um, suddenly, I think it was like a few months later, like, I mean, twice the, the amount of time, I just found this baby in there, like <laughs> chilling with the adults. Um, like I, I, I was walking by and I see Sappy, which is the female, and she's very bold now for a red-eyed crocodile, for, excuse me, red-eyed crocodile skin. And there's, yeah, this little flash of orange beside her. Like it darted back. I was like, wait, what? So I go in with like my iPhone light. I just, just kind of gently shine it down under the wood. And I can see it's like head there. I'm like, oh my gosh. Like they hatched a baby like in the enclosure. Like I've had this happen crazy enough with satanic leaf tails where I just suddenly found a baby in there. Like, oh my God, I'm glad I found you. You would have gotten eaten for sure. But uh, yeah, they hatched the offspring. And I had heard that I read a paper somewhere. It's just troubling because I need to find where it was from, but they were discussing like how this species exhibits some interesting behavior and actually moving their egg around the enclosure in captivity, or I don't think it was documented in the wild to like, I guess, systematically uh, offer it the needs it, throughout the incubation process. If it's too dry, move it somewhere else. And I've actually seen an egg move around the enclosure. I haven't seen them do it. I'd love to catch them in the act, but I've like seen an egg in one spot and then it wasn't there anymore. And then it was somewhere else. I don't know what they're doing there. That's it's amazing. crazy. Uh, yeah. It's, it's weird. Um, and they get so big before they hatch too. But uh, yeah, so that was very interesting. And then also the fact that yes, like the offspring will live with them for some time. And if I were to assume based on how other animals work, I would be more concerned about an animal reaching sexual maturity and being like a, a male, for example, and still being in that group. But um, as it stands now, like I have some of those first offspring still with that pair and they're living quite comfortably in that group. And I've had some other keepers from like Germany uh, contact me being like, hey, like, how's that working? Because like, I'm concerned. Are they really not being aggressive? Like, no, like I watch them. There's very minimal food competition. I have seen like, for example, one offspring grab a cricket and then the other one comes and you have that like Jurassic Park scene where they're dead in half <laughs> yeah, or whatever yeah. and they share it. Um, and I did also notice interesting behavior that a lot of the new, like newly hatched neonates will actually um, wait for the parents to grab a cricket. And now I can't say this is systematic, but it really looks like it. And while they're chewing them, they come run up to them and like pick something off it and then run off again. So maybe they're just learning the behavior that it's an easy way to feed themselves. But the adults don't seem to mind, which is interesting. They're not like trying to get away from them. So they'll like, you know, grab a little cricket drumstick off the side. And, and they themselves are very capable of grabbing crickets too. Um, but I just, the way I go about feeding them is I just drop different size crickets in anyway. So sorry, this is like this learning process and observing all these interesting things. And here I am going, okay, well, this is cool. So let me put out the word and say, like, I have two babies at the time in the enclosure with the adults. Let me see who else has these animals. Maybe we can do like a breeding swap, you know, like uh, I'll, I'll, I'll offer you one of my offspring and you offer me one of yours. And then now we have new bloodlines to work with. 
And I quickly realized that the only messages I was getting back were people asking me, hey, so I know you're looking for trades, but like, would you consider selling me one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and that's very nice. Like, I appreciate people's interest, but like, that wasn't my intention, right? Like, I really was hoping to swap some bloodlines. And honestly, I, I think I, I didn't really find anyone. Maybe it was like a all reptiles in Toronto, they had one offspring and they wanted to hold on to it. That was like the only person I could find that had any babies wow. in Canada. So I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to have to do this myself. Like, this is just a problem. Like they're doing pretty well for me. What is this? So I found someone who imported a bunch and uh, I brought them in. I, I bought eight of them. I was hoping they would be able to sex them well for me. And I set them all up the same way. Initially, I had them in tubs to kind of do like a quarantine thing. And I was trying to, uh, well, I documented the whole process. Like if anyone wants to see it, like I have, I called it like the project mini dragon series on my channel. And it's been a bit of a rocky road. Unfortunately, I did lose two of the animals. Um, but uh, it's one of those things, you know, some people will suggest that there are animals that don't do well coming out of the wild into quarantine. They suggest setting them up naturalistically right away to minimize stress. I don't know if you've heard any of that before. Like I've heard people doing that, not with that specific species, but I know I've, I've talked to people that do that with yeah. wild caught just to minimize stress. But in this case, did that, you don't think that worked or? So, yeah. So the thing was that I first wanted to do the quarantine. So I was, I didn't want to keep them like, dry on paper towel or anything so i had them set up with soil and water dishes and hides like cork like panels to hide under and everything and i felt that they just weren't doing well like i was weighing them like okay these guys are losing a bit of weight this is not good so initially i thought before i immediately start like exercising intervention with a vet which i really should have done with my vet immediately but i would set them up naturalistically and see how they did for a bit and they started not doing so well. So I got in touch with my vet and we started treating them. And all of that is documented on the channel because, again, I really want to use my platform to show people what I'm doing, whether it's right or wrong. But also, like, especially when it's right, yeah. um, to encourage them to do the same or, or, or at least give them that option. That they can do that. So they were all treated with... Um, the ceftazidine, well, no, sorry. Some of them were treated with ceftazidine because there was a bit of a red blushing. There was a concern for us uh, that it was septicemia or something. And then um, the others and those same animals were treated with Panicure. And uh, what was the other drug? Actually, I think I have it here. Let me just check. I still have it over here because we just finished the treatment. The other drug, I think, was for a different type of, a different group of parasites. Oh, the metronidazole. Okay. So they were uh, all treated with that. And I continue to weigh them. And literally, man, like <laughs> over the span of a few days, uh, the the animal in the worst condition nearly doubled in weight within a week. Really? And yeah. And I have this old Sony camcorder. It's like such a blessing to have. I bought this. This is my first camera I invested in. Uh, when I started my YouTube channel, it has a night vision setting. So I use it to this day. And these animals are rather crepuscular in nature. So I'll record them and put dishes out of worms so I can document if they're actually eating because the uh, new animals in particular are just so shy that I never see them out. Mm. So I've actually caught quite a bit of footage of the animals coming out and running around and doing their thing. Like they'll come down and drink from the water feature and tilt their heads up and swim and soak and then pick a worm off and run under the hides. So I'm like, yes. Okay. So I know they're eating now and it's so just positive and reassuring to see. Um, and yeah, so I guess like the update I hope to give in a week or so is that all those animals are really coming around now. So it's exciting to me because it also clearly demonstrates a successful way of medicating wild caught uh, triple anotis, like the red eye crocodile skink. So it, I hope that people can find this content like right away they should consider uh, that form of medication if they have wild caught animals that aren't thriving i mean obviously they should bring their animal to the vet uh, a well-informed veterinarian and, and assess what the issue might be but like at the very least they have kind of like some form of blueprint to go by and know that this works they can even show that video to their vet if they want um 
and uh, yeah, so that's kind of just been my journey with them yeah. right now. It's well, since amazing. February. Oh, yeah. And you, you, for one, you have an incredible vet. You have this amazing yeah. ex- exotic vet that does, and he even filmed some videos with you because right now, obviously, you can't go into the clinic. And so I'm yeah. glad that all of that worked out. That's incredible. Yeah, that's another thing I should say. I should give huge thanks to Alec Brown. He's just such a good vet. And it's funny. We actually, uh, I mean, like, we didn't really go to school together so much, but we, like, crossed paths, and, and I've known him for quite a few years. So it's it's really nice to have a vet that you're actually friends with, too, and, and can have, like, informal conversations with about uh, even his own projects. Like, he breeds uh, the Lycodactylus Williamsi mm-hmm. and a lot of cool animals himself. So, um, but, yeah, I'm so appreciative because it's it's one of the things – I mean, honestly, everything I do on my channel, and I know that you are a firm believer of like enrichment and such too, but also besides that, like I really try to encourage hobbyists to not only build a sense of community, but to like emphasize that importance of always doing better and really striving for the animals to give them the best experience possible, like living in captivity. So um, I think that there is... And I know, sorry, I don't know if like we're going a little off the rails here no, because no you asked about the red-eyed crocodile skin project, but it applies with Alec or Dr. Brown, I should say. Um, I really, in recent months, like after seeing the positive uh, feedback on on doing these vet-related videos, because I was like, well, okay, I have to go to the vet. Let me document it to show people. Uh, I really want to emphasize or show that like seeing a vet who's qualified to treat reptiles is an important thing. And I think a lot of people are intimidated by it. Mm -hmm. They assume that like they take their lizard, it's going to be thousands or who knows what, but in most cases, it really isn't. You're walking out of there having spent maybe $150, $100, depending what it was. And your pet is now like has a clean bill of health. And so I really want to like remove the stigmas or, you know, uh, with, with that because a lot of people are like well i know better than my vet yeah like i know what to do like they don't understand and i'm not trying to say that there aren't cases where unfortunately there might be certain vets that don't have a lot of experience and like that is an issue in itself and i think as as a veterinarian medicine advances like there'll be um you know a lot more training available and such but i think it's also so important to associate yourself with and then find a really good trained vet that can treat your animals and, and not to shy away from that. If it's a necessary thing, like I having worked in um, the pet store industry or like, I mean, I should say (laughs) working in pet stores or retail, I can't tell you the amount of times I've heard someone say like, well, like the, uh, my leopard gecko is 70 bucks. Like, yes. When they, when, and you know, they're like, Oh, uh, do you know how to, I think something's wrong with my leopard gecko. It's tails going a bit thin. Like, man, I guarantee you would have spent $150 to treat that animal. Maybe like it was some parasite issue or who, you know, some light antibiotics would have done the trick and everything would be fine. Um, But I think a lot of people shy away from it because they assume they're going to have to take on this immense financial burden. And it's not usually the case. So especially if you regularly do it, because you're not going to get that crazy surprise. And I've even spoke to vets on the phone for free you know like emailed the clinic and oh, say hey i have a quick question like if, if i could have a like i'm i've been willing to pay for a consult on the phone if, if that's possible but they'll phone me and then no bill comes you know they just they're willing to have a 10 15 minute conversation with you i have a couple mm-hmm. of questions and yeah it's they are out there you just have to find the ones like you have you know the, the ones that know what they're talking about and there are lots of them out there but you have to be careful that you don't go to like a dog vet and and then that's where you know run into trouble yeah. And that happens too. But so, yeah, the, like the thing that's just so wonderful with this is that we've discussed it in brief and well, we've kind of had a few conversations about it and we see like how great and uh, like the receptivity towards like people that they really want to see more of these vet related mm-hmm. appointments and videos. So we've kind of discussed that, like, I mean, hopefully it's not going to be a negative thing. <laughs> like I don't want to have to go if I don't have to go, but you know what I'm saying? It's just that uh, we're going to really try to show more of that. And, and I'm so grateful and appreciative that uh, Dr. Brown's willing to film that content like COVID permitting or, you know, based on that situation, it's just been so cool. So, um, you know, like we're looking forward to, I mean, I guess we're going to talk about it at some point, but uh um, the next ultrasound on the Chinese crocodile lizards will probably be in the next week or two. So that's another opportunity to film that's coming up. And 
it's going to be really cool. So I have that playlist that I throw all the videos in that are like vet related. And I think it's a really positive thing. So it's really great to have that opportunity to show that to my audience. Yeah. And it's, you're doing a great job being a role model showing, yes, I use this as well. And this is why it's important. So as far as the wild caught skinks going, they're obviously doing great now. They're doing a lot better. And so when do you have ideas of when you'll pair them? It won't be for a few months, I'm sure. Or yeah. So, um, funny enough, and there's a whole story to how it happened. Like I ended up getting more skinks than I asked for. And it became a bit of like a, a thing, but like currently I've sort of put some of the animals, like, I don't know. I It's tough because I don't want to say, I certainly don't take any credit. I'm not spearheading this, you know, like there's, there's a, there are a lot of keepers in Europe that are keeping their skinks a certain way and having a lot of success breeding them. But They also would say like, don't keep two females together. They'll fight. And I haven't experienced that. So right now, most of the animals that I'm keeping here are kept with the same sex. So I do actually have a few animals cohabiting, but they're not like paired up, if that makes sense, while they're being treated. And they're getting along fine. Funny enough, most of the time, despite the fact they have several hiding spots where they could easily get away from each other, they'll choose to rest side by side through the day. So I don't know, maybe if suddenly there was more room or less room, there would be a a, a territorial response, but like the way I'm doing it. And that's something I always emphasize in my videos that I'm not like some supreme, like infallible source of information. I always express my um, experience of keeping animals as like something I'm learning about constantly and, and sharing what, I learn with my audience. Like I don't ever want them to think that I know everything. And Mm -hmm. like, I I make mistakes too. And I try my best not to, but uh, um, anyhow, so the way I've been keeping them now is like, yes, there are animals that are cohabiting, but they're not like systematically put together a breed, especially not in that condition. So yes, the hope would be that hopefully as their weights go up um, and I just see continuous, like good feeding behavior. And it's nice. Cause I'm starting to see some of them actually come out now during the day while I'm typing, of course I look over and they dart away, but that's <laughs> normal. Uh, then yeah, like I'll, I'll look at pairing them up. And my hope is that uh, being kept the same way as I guess my OG pair, the original pair there, they're going to hopefully have the same, uh, I guess, willingness to, to reproduce. So I don't expect that to happen soon, seeing how long it took the other ones to kind of settle or kick in a gear. Um, but yeah, that's the hope. So, I mean, if all goes well, like I have quite a few of them. There's um, in total, I have literally five pairs of the crocodile skinks and three juvenile offspring. And it was very sweet. I actually had a subscriber and I made the video last year who contacted me a few months ago, actually offering me their pair for free because they saw the project I was doing and, and um, they themselves were, I guess, not really having any luck breeding them and thought that they might do better in my care. And I was like, honestly, I was just blown away. Like it's so generous. And I was like, are you sure? Like I'd be happy to buy them or like, this is just quite a act of generosity. So they just joined the group now and they're like long-term caught and like they've been in captivity for so long and it makes me think of the whole weight thing that i mentioned because those animals one of them he's had for 12 years in captivity and they weigh about almost twice as much as any of the other skinks i have so it really makes me wonder like what do we know about these animals like how long are they like reproductively functional like how long can they actually breed how long can they live? Yeah. Because they don't look worn out. They're very healthy. They're just like twice the size of some of the other ones that have all the, I guess, mature coloration already. So that's the other thing is like a lot of the other animals I would assume are reproductively ready besides like their poor health at the current state while improving health. Um, But those other animals are like twice the size. I was like, wow, like, there's just so much to learn about them still, I think. That's pretty cool. Well, and that's sort of the theme with a lot of reptiles that we keep in captivity. We, who knows how long they live for? How, who knows if we optimize their health and their nutrition and their habitat, yeah. how, how well they'll do. So so let's shift over to the Shinisaurus because that's another incredibly yeah. interesting breeding project that you must yeah. be one of the only ones in Canada doing this. 
Yeah, so uh, a very close friend of mine in, in the Canadian hobby who actually just um, left the country, now moved back home, uh, I would say, I guess it's been, I don't know, maybe almost eight years ago, he imported quite a few of them. And um, I I knew him like years before, and uh, uh, it's my friend Manny York. He, he, um, he, I guess like over time only had three of them. There was a male and two females. And when I, when I'd hang out with him in Vancouver, when I lived there still, like I'd see those animals like, man, like they are incredible. I always thought they were amazing. Like you'd see them in Facebook groups and people keeping them and like um, being viviporous is also quite fascinating among other things. And I, if I'm not mistaken, like they're the only living member of their genus that like still exists like for shinosaurus is just one species in the mm-hmm. genus um a crocodilurus so uh i i at a certain point i told them i was like listen like i know i have no idea what to expect for the cost or anything i was like if there's ever a time and i mean no disrespect but there's ever a time that you decide because at the he was also very into dart frogs and all the different genera especially like the ophagas and some of the rare stuff. There's every time you decide that you don't want to keep these animals anymore, please consider asking me if I would like to purchase them from you before you ask anyone else. And like a few months later, he's like, Hey man, so <laughs> remember that conversation you had? And I was like, wow, like I couldn't believe it. So yeah, we worked out a deal and everything. And so the thing is, yes, you mentioned they're so rare. Um, he got them I don't know, it must have been like maybe two or three years before they were listed to CITES 1, which is necessary, but unfortunate. It makes it so hard to get more or anything. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, so they're some of the only ones in the country. But, yeah, so he, we worked it out that, uh, yeah, and I, I purchased the animals from him. And um, ZooMed also was very intrigued. And, in, like, I, I'm close friends with uh, Anis Hotek. He's the, I guess, the Canadian representative for ZooMed and and uh, they worked out a, a collaboration. They were really um, wanting to uh, help support like me setting them up. So a few months before bringing them in, I set up like a large paludarium enclosure for them. My goal eventually was to house them individually, but I really didn't know anything about how they behave. So I'll explain for it. Like, um, and yeah, so they, they, they came in and um, they were doing all right. I, I, like, I think they were a little on the lean side. So Right away, I, I like I received them a year ago now. I think it's almost been a year that I've had them. Maybe early July or end of this month would have been a year that I've had them. Uh, I was thinking, okay, well, like, yeah, we'll see how they do for now. And they settled in slowly. I started to learn about how they behave. And they're very, I don't want to say they're lethargic animals, but they don't do a whole lot of much. Like they just kind of sit around and bask sometimes, or they're always in the water with just their head poking out. And then food comes into the picture and they're very animated and active and they want to eat. But otherwise, like they're very, they just, they rest a lot throughout the day. So that was one of the reasons why I was like, okay, so do I really need to, (laughs) I mean, the enclosure, when you see it, like it is, it's a 36 by 18 by 36 zoom ed with the front opening doors. So I've had people be like, oh, you should keep them in a bigger enclosure. And I mean, I may very well decide to separate each of them. But like for the while, they weren't being aggressive. They were just getting along and, and I'd feed them all. And, and yeah, but they were very shy at first. And over time, they became more tolerant. And it's sort of the similar process I do with a lot of the other animals. I'll, I'll encourage them to like walk onto my palm for something. Like they love night crawlers. It's one of their favorite things to eat. And you, you offer them those. They don't care where they have to go. They'll follow you into it. It's actually how I coax them into the containers to take them to the vet. I don't like to grab them and, and stress them. So I just hold the container open and drop a night crawler and they'll just swim up, climb into the container, just tilt it up, put the lid on. I'm like stress-free experience. You got food out of it, right? Yeah. So, um, And yeah, so I, I decided not to cool the animals because part of um, their natural, I guess, process in the wild for their biology and they, they undergo a, like a I don't know if it's a proper brumation or if it's almost more of like a hibernation actually like they really they they bury themselves under like moss and leaves and or maybe even soil as well and they they go dormant for like the whole winter in China and Vietnam where they're from other different localities and it's for quite a few months and 
then they come out of this with the warming weather. And it's then when they usually become reproductively active and then um, the female's gestation period, again, they're, they're vivid porous, so they give birth to live young in the water. It usually lasts about nine months on average from what I've read. Hope I'm not making any mistakes here, but yes, that is what I've read. Uh, and there's a few Shinisaurus Facebook groups that have been very helpful as far as like the community goes of keepers. Uh, but what's also interesting is sometimes the female's gestation can last through that hibernation period. So there are cases where a female will be um, carrying offspring through the winter and, and give birth in the spring. So last year, because of the animals being a bit underweight, I decided that I would hold off on considering any type of dormancy because I was like a little scared of like doing that with animals that maybe aren't already in like prime weight. Mm. And it, it really didn't have any adverse effect on them. Um, I think maybe they almost underwent a little bit of it regardless because this is a basement unit. And although I kept most of the temperatures consistent, I think naturally there was a bit of like a dip. Um, and yeah, I think come spring, I started noticing like the male, like I'd be in my living room or working at a desk or something. And I'd hear some splashing and the male was very actively chasing the females. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Like it, it's almost like you have this nervous feeling because you know how rare the animals are. And I want to be clear that like, I'm not, I'm not someone who cares about like, Oh, I want to have all the rare things. It's not even that. Like, I just know that what a privilege or gift it is to be able to have these animals in my care. So I feel an immense responsibility and like making sure that I breed them. Like there's two females and a male, like this has to happen. Right. Um, so like, but I didn't have any anticipation as when I'd be able to get to that point. So just seeing that male, like clearly chasing around the females. And once I walked down my hall way and he uh, actually had a female pinned in like a position for copulation, but like let her go and dove into the water. Like, no, um, it was nice to see because I was like, okay, well clearly this is happening while I'm not watching. So I was like, okay, we'll leave it. And then a few months ago, um, I, uh, I guess I should backtrack and say that like they're, they're, the sexual dimorphism with the animals isn't always so obvious. A lot of people will say like the males have a broader head and the coloration is usually much more vibrant on the males. Um, but I do have one female that's a bit large and, and does have some nice coloration. So uh, back last October, we, we went to Dr. Brown to have the animals ultrasound to accurately sex them. And he did see follicles in both females and the other one lacked them and possibly he also noticed the hemipenes. So, sorry. Now this year uh, we decided to do a follow-up ultrasound to see what was going on, if anything was going on, because there was um, the hope that there was copulation occurring. And what we found was very different. It was very exciting. Like there was actually very large developed follicles and even like a separation between like the circular lining and something within. So, he mentioned that it would be really interesting to uh, document this process and see how they develop because we're fairly confident that the animals are, um, in fact, I guess, do I say gravid or yeah, I, th I think it's still gravid, uh, producing offspring. So that's where we're at now. And we want to kind of minimize the amount of stress they undergo because it really, there was some concern from my audience. They're like, oh, we'll just leave them alone. Don't do the ultrasounds. But it's really, it's such minimal stress for them. Like, it's only every few months or so that we're going to just do a gentle ultrasound and there is minimal handling in the whole process anyway. So, and he also said like, I wouldn't even request doing it unless it was safe for them. So, um, but yeah, so it's going to be really exciting to see. That's kind of where we're at. Like, I don't want to jump the gun, but very clearly something is going on in, in terms of like, um, like they're, they're not just follicles, like there's development going on in them. And we were very lucky to see, through the footage that Dr. Brown recorded with his assistant that that's happening. So, yeah. Well, and I think it's important to document it, even if there is some stress involved, inducing some stress with the ultrasound, it's, yeah. it'd be so much better to have this documented clearly for, you know, future rounds of this. And mm -hmm. do you mind telling us how much you paid for them? I don't mind. Yeah. So I got very lucky. Um, I would say like, I think I, I, in the end I paid $3,000 for them for all three. Yeah. <laughs> and what what would that realistic count? Yeah, if if you remove the friend discount, what do you think it would have been? I don't know, because the thing is is like I want to say I see them go for around 
I could be exaggerating. It might depend on the size and age, but I usually see them go for 1,500 to 200 or two to 200, 2000 uh, <laughs> USD in the States is what yeah. I seem to see. And that's hard to say because like Facebook doesn't really let you show that, but like I've seen in a few like classifieds and things they are usually around like 1500 for a younger animal, I think. So really, so I don't even you know. probably could have got like eight grand Canadian for three It's of them. quite possible. But I mean, again, and I always tell him like how much I appreciate it. Like he's, he's such a good friend and uh, I, I was blown away and I didn't want to take advantage. But I was like, are you sure? And yeah, so that's, that's uh, what we did. And um, yeah, honestly, I have, it's, it's just been crazy. Um, but so, so in the process, I've been trying to connect with a few other keepers and out of respect, I mean, I don't know if they want it. I don't know if they want other people to know they have them. I, I don't know. Like, I just, I'm sure they'd be fine with it, but I just won't say in case. Um, I mean, I know that there's a. Uh, like Stefan from indiv- the Trarium channel. He's yes. been on the podcast before and he's has a video on them. Yeah. I was just going to say, so, yeah. but, oh no, but I meant in Canada specifically. Oh, I see. Gotcha. gotcha so gotcha. Uh, one, I'm forgetting his last name. Cody in Alberta. I know he publicly posts them, so it's fine to mention. Yeah, uh, he has at least a few, and some of his locked up this year. I don't know what the situation is with that. And then there's one other individual I know that has a few animals uh, that's kind of closer to me uh, geographically here speaking. So I'm like in communication with everyone I know that has them because I want to make sure that if they're going to reproduce any that we're going to be swapping some animals. Cause like yeah. we need to work together. And it really sucks though, because I, I've, I know very little about importing and exporting CITES animals. Um, I've heard it's not like completely impossible to import CITES one animals, but of course it'd be like incredibly challenging. And I, I, I don't know if it's even something I can learn about or ex- an option I can exercise, but yeah, I mean, I guess you just kind of worry about, inbreeding and things like that right i mean at the very least I, i'm fairly confident my two females in the male are unrelated and that, that's great um but yeah this we're working with a small gene pool in canada it sounds like i think to as far as i know there's maybe nine in the country including mine it's Although not terrible with, but yeah with nine you could still do some pretty significant swapping absolutely yeah so well but, i think you guys are going about it the right way then yeah i hope so and again, I don't want to jump the gun. Like, I really hope things are happening here. Like, it really looks like it. The one female is just like, pfft, she's she's starting to swell. And I don't know if you've seen photos of like uh, female Chinisaurus when they're close to full term. It's, it's you feel so bad for them. They're just gargantuan, <laughs> like really, really large, swollen uh, animal. And it's so fascinating. Just they're really cool animals. Ultimately, I. I I started like thinking about how I'm going to house the offspring because I've oh sorry, Mr. Miss system. <laughs> there we go. Um, that was short. It was like a five second mist. Yeah, I have I have some uh, very short cycles going on in some of the dart frog tanks, but oh, okay. it's like every two hours because there's uh, more ventilation uh, in those enclosures. It's those frogs and co tanks. So gotcha. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, uh, but yeah, um, yeah, we have to just see how it goes, I guess. And uh, yeah, the whole documenting is part of the fun in that as well. So yeah, uh, well, I'm <laughs> another calling. They like the rain, <laughs> <laughs> the Luca Malice. <laughs> well, it's going to be really interesting. Like like you said, you're it's all on the channel, so people can you know follow along with this project. And I I really do hope you have success. Even if you don't have success this round, I'm sure you will. So that will be awesome to follow along with. So Thanks let's so jump much. to I I I, su- I I know you have a pair of the Varanus. Pr- was it Prasinus? Yes. The, the emerald yeah. tree monitors. And those are a pair, right? Yes. They're, yeah, the green trees. Uh, the Yeah, they're a pair. Um, I mean, they're not together, obviously, because right, they're right, both right. like n- not even, I don't know, maybe not even half grown yet. So, But is that uh, a project yeah. that eventually is on the horizon for you? Yeah, yeah. Like I, oh, man, I got to tell you, I don't know why I waited so long to start keeping Varanids. They're just... Sorry about those. That's so funny because they don't even make that much noise most of the time. They're probably oh, reptile like, people oh, I gotta, to hear frogs. Got to get in on them, right? <laughs> got to get in on the call. Um, yeah, they are just phenomenal animals. Like they have so much personality and they're so intelligent and inquisitive. I was really like, why did I wait this long? And so um, last year in April is when I approached Brandon of Canadian Cold Blood and I got my first animal. She's like a very young uh, neonate. 
at the time. Like, I think he always wants to wait till they're at least a month or more old. So she was a, at least that old and unsexed animal. And so I raised that. And that's the one I call Sabzi on my channel is Sabzi. Um, and I just fell in love, man. Like at first it was a bit stressful learning about <laughs> the shyness and everything and uh, working with that. And um, I, I put a lot of emphasis because there's a few people in Europe. I know there's a, what's her last name? Roman in Switzerland. She's on Instagram and a few other places. And she always posts these really exciting videos of her interacting with her Priscinus. And she's using like different dog toys and things. And I've given her credit in my videos. That, like, I need to do that with mine. Like, this is so cool. And especially you would know, like with Varenids, they're such intelligent animals. You really want to offer that form of uh, enrichment. Like I think every reptile as a standard should have enrichment, but especially animals like that. Um, so I was like, oh, well, part of that process is going to be conditioning the animal to be tolerant of handling and everything. So I really got into that. And I don't know if you've seen on the channel, like over time, yeah, she really became so comfortable with me. I take her out. Like if I walk into the room, she's like, oh, you're there. And like wants to come out right away, throw her up. And she climbs on my shoulders, chills and moves around and is always eagerly waiting for food and treats. And I've had different like toys and puzzles for her. And I have a few others that I'd like to use for video. And I just bought a clicker now. I'm wanting to see if I can target train her. We'll see how that goes. So I bet you'll have no problem with that. Yeah, I'm really hoping it'll be something I can do on the channel. I, I only worried a little bit because it's not something I did initially. So it's something I really want to do now going forward just because the animal's getting larger and I have had the odd time where she misses a cricket and grabs my finger. Mm. And it's to no fault of her own and she realizes quickly that it's not food and let's go. But like there's still a bit of a consequence involving some blood if when it yeah. happens. So I'm like, okay, well, for smaller things, definitely at least it'd be good to implement some target training. So yeah, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, I, again, it, it comes into like what we discussed with breeding and stuff. I was like, man, if there was a species I want to breed, it's the green tree monitors. Like they're so cool. So I know for some time I was like, well, do I want to do that? Or do I maybe want to try having like one of the McCray or something like the blue trees? Cause they're also so beautiful and oh, incredible. Yeah. Right. Um, but no, I was like, no, I think I'd rather, I'd rather dedicate that space it would take to having two of the same species and, and be able to reproduce them and, and raise some of the offspring and, and really implement those same um, steps I took to taming them, right? Because it was just so rewarding and it would be so great for whoever would bring those animals to their home, right? Hopefully it would uh, translate and help for them and their experience keeping their animals. Well, I, yeah, I think you'd like the intel. Every time I've talked to somebody who's got into monitors late after they've been keeping other reptiles, they're just like, I can't believe this species. It's just unbelievable the way they behave. They're so smart. And, and you know, one of my friends, Lori Torini, I'm not sure if you're familiar with her, but she has, she does lots of snake training and she target trains all of her snakes and even yeah. snakes that are late in life that she's acquired somehow, she's able to target train them. And it's really incredible. So I think a monitor, you would have literally no problem with that. Uh -huh. I mean, they're, you know, they're like parrots, right? Yeah. Well, no, for sure. I know it's possible. Like I even have seen, there was an animal at the university of Guelph that was target trained too. And I've seen it on videos and other folks have done it. I just worried about like the fact that I've gone so long without doing it, but you're right. I'm sure it'll be fairly straightforward or easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're a beautiful, beautiful species. And I think one of the enclosures is behind your shoulder there. I wanted to ask Actually, about yeah. the, the cork background. What, what do you, what is that? Is that just something that is that just like a cork board that you put pins in or no? Yeah. So it's actually a, it's an insulation cork. There's a oh, company okay. out in BC that does this. And I think if people tune into this, they're really going to want to know this because I, for a while I wasn't sharing because I was working out like a collaboration with them and then they bailed on it. So I was like, ah, why do I have to advertise with them? But yeah, there's a company based on BC. I'd be happy to share with you um, that like, sells it it's insulation cork for sound insulation but also like just for home insulation mm. and they sell huge cases of it i guess and it's quite the investment to buy a whole thing because you can't just like buy one tile um but it works so great i think a lot of people uh use this and so i actually just silicone it to the sides and the back and i use it in a few different enclosures as well not just the tree monitors but i like it because especially with the exoterras like, um, or any of the more commercial enclosures with the screen top, 
it, it also just helps insulate a bit better. Like, yeah, you're still going to lose a bit of heat out the top, but I do lay some of it down on the screen as well to hold in more heat between like spaces where the fixtures are. Um, but yeah, it gives them so much more surface area to climb. And that's the important thing, right? So besides the branches, everything crisscrossing in there, and this is, this is where I keep my juvenile male Basil. He's in there right now. But yeah, it just looks natural and it, it's simple and you can't, the animals can't get stuck behind it, which sometimes happens with some of the, like the foam yeah. backgrounds, like especially the mm -hmm. exoterra ones that come with it. There's like those slots where animals go, by, go yeah, behind. Yeah, or the and, crickets. Yeah, or the crickets. Yeah, you can't, so you can't lose anything. So it, it, are you willing to say the, the name of that company or? Oh yeah, uh, shoot. Um, if you forget it, it's no problem. I no, honestly, I kind of forget it, but let me look it up while we're chatting here. Um, yeah, I'll put it in the show notes for people. For I'm sure it's not cost effective no. for Americans, but for Canadians, they yeah yeah have yeah a lot of enclosures that might let work out. Let me find out. it. I'm sure if I just write cork, it'll come. A uh, thermocork. Thermocork. Yes, thermocork, and okay. the uh, it's small planet supply. Is okay. where I got it from. I'll put that in the show notes for people if they're interested. Sounds good. Cool. Well, let's uh, let's jump onto the Europlatus because I want to talk to you a little bit about that, and then we'll, right. we'll finally wrap up with the with your YouTube channel because we haven't even talked about that yet. I have yeah, some questions no in there, but for for the Europlatus, I think you have another one of the amazing things that you've done on your your YouTube channel is you've just done a great job documenting several different projects sort of concurrently, and one of them is the Europlatus. Obviously, you mentioned them before. You're doing some breeding. But you, I don't know if downgraded is the right word, but you changed the setups and you sort of moved away from this bioactive breeding yeah. setup that you had. So maybe you could talk about that whole process because it's really interesting. I think we've hit on this on the podcast before. Bioactive is not always the gold standard. And sometimes I think yeah. it becomes a buzzword and people just assume that if it's bioactive, they're good to go. But your experience, I think, highlights why that's not always the case. Sure. So, yeah, I've been keeping the uh, Europlatus fantasticus it's crazy to think now. I think it's almost been, almost been eight years. Like I think wow. I got my first ones in 2013 or 14 and, uh, it might've been 2014. So, uh, yeah, like, I mean, initially I, I kept them all bioactive and that definitely worked well for me with a, a large level of success. Like I can say that I've produced, I guess it must be now at least 30 to 40 of the animals off and on. And that also has a lot to do with like low years, not owning many of them. And then at some point owning more and things like that, but definitely 40 or more, I'd say that I've produced uh, over the years. And um, in the more recent years, I've had, I guess, some issues with them. Um, just like animals would randomly drop. And I don't want to make it seem like it was happening often. It wasn't. It would just be here and there. But in some of the cases, after doing a post-mortem, um, it wasn't really conclusive what the cause of it was or that maybe there was some sort of like infection. One time it was because there was an issue with an animal's ovary when I did a post-mortem. And that was something that honestly, it's like, what do you call it? Not an act of God, but like what the problem is with an animal that small operating on them is really not an issue the way the veterinary medicine is in this day and age at this point like we don't really have that option because it's like you're basically operating on an insect like a glorified yeah, exactly. insect exactly yeah you can't put them under they're so small so it was very unfortunate but yes i did lose one animal like that last year that's what the uh, labs came back with in the whole report i have um but i Again, with all the species I keep, especially the ones that are less commonly represented in the hobby, I am in close communication with anyone else who's having a large amount of success or success keeping them. Because it's not to say that I want to replicate what they're doing, but at least like consolidate the information and like put it together and think about like how I can incorporate elements of it into what I'm doing to ensure that I'm on the right track. Funny thing about the Fantasticus is that if you talk to a lot of the keepers that are um, breeding this species, they themselves will also have random occurrences where seemingly healthy animals just drop. And we know that generally speaking, this species in particular, and most of the genus really likes colder temperatures, which I don't have any trouble achieving. Like they're all kept with their fans and everything. They're around like 72 and even before, like the fans just help for air circulation. Well, I'll get to that. Um, so I, um, 
I noticed that I, I did bring in a few imported animals last year to grow my, like my, I guess, gene pool, you'll see, you could say. And I also kept a few of the animals uh, in small, like quarantine bins. Like they're literally bins on paper towel with a few branches and fake plants and always a water dish, of course. And I noticed that none of the problems I was having <laughs> were coming from the animals that were housed that way. Now that could have been a coincidence, the thing that really sparked the no, it's not something is up for me was that I once found a female in the bioactive enclosure on the ground and her collar was all off. And I know, like I've been keeping the animals so long, you just know, never mind being on the floor. Like sometimes the color is a certain way. It's like a lot of faded color, but then there's just like this intensity. And usually the, the, the center of the tail, like kind of almost like the tendril of a leaf will look kind of enlarged and swollen. You just know the animal's like not doing good. So the, I, the only thing I could think to do is take her out of that bioactive situation and move her into one of these sterile bins. And I kid you not, she somehow bounced back. And I honestly thought this animal was not like going to make it. She bounced back over the span of a day or two. And, and a lot of that was just not touching her or anything, just leaving her be, not even feeding her for those two days. And she's thriving. I have her. She's fine. So it could have been a coincidence. I started to feel that it was an issue pertaining to ventilation and like fresh airflow and also maybe keeping the animals too humid. Now, I always say this all like, again, as my own experience, because there's so much to consider. Is it more dry in this basement in Canada? Like, am I de dealing with different conditions than someone in the States or in the UK or wherever? Like, I can only share it and offer it as my own experience. And I am very cautious to preach to my audience, like, hey, don't, I don't think that these animals should be kept bioactive. That's not at all what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have immense success keeping the genus bioactive. I would encourage people to do so. Um, this has just been my experience. I'm finding that they're doing really well this way and I'm not having any issues. So I started this, I guess, endeavor to uh, see it's not an experiment. Like it's based on some, some factual evidence that suggests they're doing really well. Right. It's not like, let me see how they do not bioactive, but I decided to switch them onto this different setup and they're doing really well. Like within the first day of moving them into the same exoterras with mist kings and misting cycles, but now also computer fans and a systematic like lay bin. Um, the second night I had them in there, First of all, I mean, they weren't paired up before, so it was kind of natural that might happen, but I documented three pairs. There were two copulating and one, the male was exhibiting some tail waving and it's part of like their breeding ritual. And then the next night there was a female in the laying bin and she laid some eggs. So it's like, come on. I mean, I'm very happy that it seems to be going well, at least. Um, yeah, it's it's very yeah. interesting. I think you nailed it with the, the the humidity and the ventilation, and that can be major issues in mm -hmm. bioactive setups, especially when you're using something like an exoterra where there is ventilation to the top, but it's not like a screen cage where you have air moving through, and if you don't have a fan coming through to cycle the air. Yeah. And I think that's where sometimes herpetoculture runs into trouble because people think, you know, like I'd already mentioned, oh, it's bioactive, so I'm doing the best thing possible, but you don't think about, okay, is the humidity off? And so in, in their in their natural habitat in Madagascar, are they kind of part of that sort of more dry forest area or were they kind of ex living? So as far as I understand, their, their range is more on the East Coast and it's higher elevation and it is cooler. But from what I know based on literature, it is the fact that they're actually in a more, I think, humid climate or at least that, that sees a lot of rainfall because I think a lot of like the accumulation of, I guess, like weather systems are coming from the east towards the west. And then you have like the whole west side of Madagascar. It's like very, very dry. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's also a, due to deforestation and erosion and other things that are going on there. But like most of the jungly, like very lush parts of the country are on the east coast of what remains. So I, I don't know. Like, I know that the whole country, from what I understand, experienced some form of a dry season. And I know that even when it comes to imports, a lot of people will recommend waiting till the fall because based on their season, the animals arrive in much better condition. So that would kind of hint to me that they do experience at least some form of dry season. I, I don't want to, again, like insinuate anything, but 
I've almost wondered if they should be kept similarly to a bronia, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. So they still need a certain level of humidity, like with fog or other things and, and, and maybe constant uh, supply of like water dripping here and there throughout the day. But there is a lot of airflow and that can be a tricky thing to have these two elements that kind of contradict each other. Like you have your airflow, but then you also re- require humidity especially right? for us in canada in the winter <laughs> yeah it's yeah. really tough your air is so dry that you're going to be pumping into the enclosure yeah and so i've kind of the way i felt is that they need to have constant access to water but that they shouldn't be constantly like wet like they're if you're going to miss the foliage in the enclosure it should dry by the time the next misting cycle happens that um uh, that they should also have like a good amount of airflow. Like I, I just, I've kind of, again, it's, it's speculation at this point, but I feel that maybe with the experience, at least I'm having with my animals is that there's something maybe with good airflow. So I have computer fans situated on every enclosure and I will be honest, I've been having to tweak that process now. Cause I had one animal, maybe it was a coincidence, just going to like a bad shed cycle. And I was worried that maybe the fan like, dry the enclosure too much despite the misting cycles but then i also know another female another enclosure shed and that she did just fine so i'm kind of like playing around with some of the settings and how i automate it with like timers and such how frequent should the fans be on constantly or like maybe for an hour or half an hour after the misting happens or something you know Mm -hmm. um so there's elements of it i'm still tweaking a bit but um yeah i just i i worry that the random droppings of like these animals just dying could be an element of uh, a humidity issue. But it's also important to realize like what representation do we have? Like a lot of these animals are dying. Maybe they're wild caught. Is something going wrong with that? Are they being treated properly? Because a lot of people also feel that sometimes you shouldn't treat them. It's just less stressful with those. And this is one of those animals in particular, people will often recommend just go straight into a bioactive scenario or situation instead of being um, quarantined. And sometimes maybe that is the case, but I think at this point I'm like, no, like definitely with these ones, I used to do it that way, but now I always um, quarantine them first for quite a few months and make sure they're doing well. And they definitely do well on the paper towel and everything. And the way I had it looks minimal ventilation, but the lids are cut out some mesh and cross drills on the side and it worked really well. Um, but yeah, the other thing to consider with bioactive and sorry, maybe you wanted to chime in before I get carried away or no, no, you can go for it. Go for it. Yeah. I was just going to say like, you also have to remember with bioactive and this is something I've even discussed with Dr. Brown again is like sometimes like you can have uh, different types of bacteria just hanging out in there that you don't want to have there. And you have mm-hmm. to consider that. And I'm not bashing bioactive. Like in every case where I think it works and, and I can do it for my animals, I want it there. Like, I think it's more enriching, but I have discussed on my channel that it's not always the easiest way to do it. And it's not always less work. I think there's a misconception that we, we think that bioactive means, oh yeah, like it's self-sustaining. I don't really have to do much, maybe wipe the glass, but like, that's really not the case. You're also maintaining your plants. You really should be removing fecal material when you find it. You shouldn't just leave it there. Um, And and yeah, like it it can be more tricky at times. You do, you have to really think about like the types of bacteria and things that are occurring there. Like they could be harmful in some scenarios or situations. So it's just kind of, yeah, like what you mentioned and have mentioned in the past. it's, it's, uh, It's not just that simple thing that like, every animal would always do better in a bioactive scenario. And it's also dependent on even individual animals. I've seen some people that breed certain types of amphibian and for whatever reason, they have some that do so well in bioactive and some they put in bioactive and they just like decline. And they're like, okay, you're going back into the sanitary, um, very clean setup and they just do so much better that way. So, yeah, it's definitely more complex. It does take more work. And it's not to say that bioactive can't be better, it's just a matter of trying to, everybody, I mean, everybody's situation is different. Your climate is different. The, the airflow, the local humidity, all of those things play into it. And mm-hmm. it can be very challenging. As far as the fans go, are you exhausting? The, are you blowing the fans into the enclosures or is it just exhausting pulling air out? I am blowing them in to okay. the enclosures and I, <laughs> I ran out of fans. So they just arrived now. I have a few that I'm installing now to go cross 
so that it'll help uh, with more air exchange and flow for what is coming into the enclosures. Because, I mean, I have lights and stuff above it too, right? And like the T5s, they have um, the Arcadia 6% UVBs above them. So I uh, also want to make sure, because those do emit some heat, that that air is like hopefully cooled, but also the room from the other, air from the other parts of the room is being pulled above that space. So what's going down is not just like kind of stagnant warm air. Yeah. Um, and well, uh, a lot of these yeah. species are, are coastal animals, right? I mean, you're living on an island, Madagascar, even crested geckos. You look at New Caledonia. Yeah. It's it's windy there. It's really windy. True. It's always That's windy because you're right, right on the ocean. And I think that fresh air is something that is very difficult to get in the hobby and i think fans are really going to become more popular mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean it's definitely a matter of like making sure that it's not on too long or like figuring out the exact amount right like you, you have to be careful with that but yeah I, I uh the fans i'm using what is the company there's something i buy off amazon and they their usb plug-in they're so great like even on their highest setting it's very low and i have the same ones on my shinisaurus enclosure because I found that that enclosure would get very humid and even the glass would fog up a bit. And I just, I had for those, like the way they come, I think you can buy single ones, but most of them that I buy there, it's like two on one uh, plug. So yeah, I, I think I bought that same, it, it is the switch, like the high, medium, low, yeah. like a toggle switch. Yeah. yeah. I have one. I have one yeah. of those fans. on one of Yeah. My they're great. Yeah. So the shinies, I have it set up that is like one blowing in one blowing out. And yeah. uh, that works really well. But these ones, it's just in. It's a really small enclosure too. So I feel like even just having it in one corner, like you're just going to get, it's going to come down and out the top on the opposite side anyways, right? Like, yeah. and so I don't want it sucking too much humidity out of the enclosure. But yeah, it's a working progress because even before, like I kind of experimented before the animals went in, like how much misting should be happening. And if it wasn't, if it was too much, like the paper towel on the bottom stayed too wet too long and, it could like create a bit of mold. So I had to really like configure how I was going to have it prior to the animals going into this setup. But so far I've been very happy with how it's going. And um, it's also one of those things that as rewarding as it is to have the animals in bioactive vivaria, it's not for me, like it's not worth the risk seeing that they're doing well like this. Like it's not, I don't think the animals care so much, you know, like they don't care if they're on fake foliage or live foliage, at least in this case. So it's really for me if, to, to enjoy the animal in a very bioactive si situation. Like the, the reason people would do it besides the, uh, the aesthetic appeal is like for the animal's benefit. And if that's not a factor in the situation right now, then I'm just happy to see them do well like this. I, I maybe would love to see about getting them back into a bioactive situation. Maybe it is really just the ventilation and I could set them all bioactive set them up bioactive and then have the fans and that would make all the difference. But for now I'm going to do it like this and then we'll like see going forward, you know? Yeah. And you can always add live plants and not go bioactive. Just add potted, small potted plants. Yeah. Like there's so many layers in between going full bioactive and being fairly sterile that work as well. It's true. And that would also create like laying site as, as well for the animals to deposit their eggs. So it's a good yeah, point. Exactly. Good suggestion. Well, let's jump on and we'll finish off with the YouTube channel because you, like I said at the very beginning, you've you've blasted through 100,000 subscribers. You are like an OG on YouTube though. Your channel's not new. You have some old videos up there. So oh. tell me about just the journey on YouTube in general because I'm sure where you are now is not where you thought you'd be when you started. Yeah, so I mean, I think, so first of all, I think, yeah, I started my channel in February 2009. If I'm not mistaken. So a while ago. And um, I mean, how old are you, by the way? Are you, I think yeah. you maybe are just a little I'm, bit younger than me. I'm 29. Oh, okay. Are you born in 92? Yeah. Okay. So I'm born in 91. So you're just, we're, we're close. <laughs> yeah. So you started this in like grade 11, basically. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Very good math. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. So I started in grade 11. I mean, prior to that, I think it wasn't many months before that I, a bit, I'm sorry. What am I trying to say? Um, like, I think I, I kind of came across YouTube and funny enough, like the first thing I wanted to do was like, look up and see if someone posted videos of like pets. And at the time, man, there was like, there weren't very many channels. I, I think I, I didn't like, I found some few random 
uh, a lot of them were children, really, which was interesting. Like I found, I think, I don't even remember the channel name. There's some uh, British boy who was like showing his chameleon and a few other critters. And it was kind of just like people just kind of, yeah, doing tours and documenting their pets. Like this is my crested gecko. This is that. And then there was Brian and snake bites, which was like super entertaining and interesting to see. Um, and I think definitely like even since then, he's been like one of the biggest channels and that was really cool. And that really inspired me. Um, there was a Canadian hobbyist that went by, I think her username was like Caterpillar Giraffe and she had a Tegu. Do you, do you know who that is? I, I think I remember that because a lot of these things are just <laughs> very small flashes in my memory and I can't pinpoint what they were. Yeah. I, I remember the, like the Tegu, like she had quite a large collection too. Yeah. Yeah. She had time. red yeah. hair. She'd go snowboarding. Yes. She's kind of like feeling that Blink-182, like Green Day punk yeah. rock vibe back then. And she's like very no BS kind of attitude. I remember. Yes. So yeah. I remember watching her videos. I was like, this is so cool. Like I could do something like this because I mean, even at the time I was considering going into teaching, that's like kind of a path I was considering taking academically. And, um, I, uh, I was like, this is such an interesting thing. Like now I'll be honest, I had no goal of like being monetized or anything. It was just like, it just seemed like a really fun way to create a sense of like small community and just share like my pets. Cause I really loved reptiles. So I remember asking my mother if she'd lend me her, uh, like, so, it was like a Sony cyber shot or something like yeah. <laughs> camera of it, just like, holy mackerel. And, you know, I, I actually leave all my old videos up and they're public. Yeah. I don't know why I do that. I mean, no, I do. I, I get a lot of young, I guess, YouTube enthusiasts that are like considering starting their own channel. They'll comment and be like, man, like your videos are so good. How do you do that? And I mean, first of all, that's so flattering. I don't always think they're that amazing, but it's very flattering. I say, listen, like, don't be discouraged. Go back and watch my oldest videos and see yeah. how this started. It's just, it's a learning process. There's so much growth that happens over time. You just have to be consistent and follow like not to be cheesy, but really like your dreams and your passion and, and you'll get there. You'll refine the process. You'll learn about editing and everything. And so, yeah, that's the main reason I leave those videos there, but yeah, sorry. So I, uh, yeah, like I just started posting videos and there was really nothing to it. Like I'd, I'd sometimes use, I don't even know what it was. It was like Microsoft video or something. Like I'd put a cheesy like movie maker or whatever. Yes, that's exactly it. Sorry. Movie yeah. maker. I'd have like a little title come up like bearded dragon like yeah it was so cheesy and like there was no method behind it like i wasn't i didn't have any understanding of what the algorithm is or anything like i was just sometimes the videos were two minutes sometimes they were five minutes i think at that time you couldn't exceed 10 or something like that or maybe that's still the case if you aren't monetized i don't know what it is now but um and yeah, I just started posting videos. And I remember I got my first subscriber and I was like so excited. It was so amazing. Like, I think I still remember their, no, what was their name? I don't know. Jacob Hooper or something like that. I remember, like, I'll <laughs> still never forget. That was like their name. And yeah, it just, it was just like fun. It was really fun to share. And I continued with that for some time. And then I think in going into school and such, I had something happen where for whatever reason uh, I remember, I don't know how like it was back then, but like I, I received an email from Google offering me an opportunity to like monetize one of my videos. And so that was like, I don't know if that's how they did it then before, like you just become a partner. Or it was, this was, we're talking 2010, right? So, so much has yeah. changed since then. Um, but they monetized one of my videos and I remember a bunch of my friends were saying like, oh, we're going to like watch it over and over and like click the ads to get you more views and stuff and money. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was like, guys, don't do that. Like, I'm 100% sure they're going to like, that's going to be a problem. And sure enough, I think after like two days, I got an email that I'm like blocked for monetization. Oh. And I was just like devastated. Again, it wasn't my goal, but it was very discouraging because I was like, what the heck? Like, come yeah, on. Yeah, for those that don't know, like Google knows everything. Yeah. You cannot click on your own ads. You can't get your yeah. family to do it. They figure it out instantly. Yeah. And again, like this was friends and family that were thinking like to do that out of love for me. And I was like, sure, yeah. it's well intended, but you just like sabotaged me. <laughs> and so... um yeah, like it really discouraged me. I I'd still continue to post videos here and there, but then after I got like in school and stuff, I'd, I'd post like once a year randomly something cool happened. Like if I like, 
I don't know, found a turtle and, and relocated it because it was like in the middle of, I remember I found a, a turtle, like it, it looked like it was like really in bad condition. And I just put it in a pond, like I just make a video about that. And so like once a year, twice a year, I'd post a video just to keep it kind of something I did. And again, just kind of as a testament that I was doing it for me and not for like the monetization or anything. But then it had been so many years and I, I guess I found a way to like contact Google and I wrote to them like the situation or whatever. And I guess maybe there's like in general a probation period that I didn't know about or whatever, but they remonetized my account. I was like, oh, cool. So then I had a few videos kind of do very well or like suddenly gain some sort of viral attention from years before. And I kind of saw the monetary potential from it. And I was like, man, I really do enjoy doing this. So I should try and be a little more systematic about it. And I'd post like some tutorials about different vivarium builds and things and saw the traction I got. I was like, man, this is cool. So I tried to make it something more consistent to just supplement what I was doing on the side. And um, it was in more recent years, like through like, not even just like the networking I was doing with different YouTubers, but like the growth that I was experiencing with the channel, I was like, man, this is just something really amazing. So I was like, well, I'll keep doing it on the side. I'm not going to like jump in two feet or anything but um after a few years i think this is this is all happening between like 2015 and now i'd say i was like okay like this is legit like if i if only i was kind of at that tipping point where i was like okay could i consider stopping what i'm doing and, and trying to just like what would happen if i put all my focus and attention into doing this full time like I would live what, modestly what else were, for a while. Yeah. Were you working? You were working, going to school, university, or what were you doing yeah, on the so other side? Yeah, so where do I start? I mean, so for, for some time I was studying in university and I really did enjoy that. But I guess like, I, I'll be honest, I, I definitely went through a period of like some pretty harsh mental health, uh, I guess, challenges with like some pretty bad anxiety and a bit of depression. And it was a really tough time for me. I was kind of trying to find myself and I felt a bit discouraged and I ended up dropping out of school actually. So I have a few years of education under my belt, like through University of Guelph is where I studied. And uh, even that, like I, I, at first I started off in environmental governance and then I studied a year in zoology. And then, yeah, I dropped out after that. And I mean, it was, it was a good experience, but yeah, like I, I spent a few years kind of finding myself and through that process, I kept taking courses online. Like I actually took it through a few Athabasca courses. Like I studied like uh, primatology and a few other things that really interested me, like behavioral primatology, I believe it was. And uh, yeah, like it was through that. And even all the while, I must say my anxiety is pretty bad. Um, and I think a lot of the reason why for me and my experience with that was that I felt like I was comparing myself to friends and family that like were really finding their path where they knew what they mm -hmm. wanted and were just like, boom, they went for it and they got it. And for me, I was like, what is going on? Like, I was so anxious about dropping out of school. Like what now? Like comparing myself to peers and really struggling. But I did find a lot of self-worth, I should say, in like the content I was creating, it gave me a sense of purpose. And I really loved that I was reaching an audience. And it was so touching to have so many people feel like so happy about what I was sharing. Um, and also even just the fact that there are a lot of individuals who suffer, I guess, from mental health challenges and, and difficulties that have actually expressed through like comments that they really feel uplifted by the content and that's like very flattering it's not necessarily something i'm like thinking about and but it's just so touching and, and it feels great to know that that's the case and it's funny like we're talking about this now but it's not something i've even opened up about on the channel to be honest um so i mean yeah i'm happy to share like if it helps and everything but um yeah so i i really must say that i would really feel that my my youtube channel is one of the things that really helped me um, gain a, a sense of self-confidence and purpose. Um, I, I mean, I always felt like good about myself, so to speak, but I had a lot of uncertainty and then feelings of fear, I guess, about the future and such. And, but like having that as something to really work on it, and it gave me still helped me give or gain a sense of drive and purpose and, and strive to like 
achieve something and mm-hmm. green two monitor walking he's zipping around. around in the back <laughs> which is great because he's the one that's always shy but um <laughs> And yeah, so I guess like things really progressed with that. And then I should add that, yeah, so then eventually I did, when I moved to Vancouver, (laughs) again, it's really learning about all elements elements of the industry. I actually was a manager at PetSmart for a while. Okay. So I saw that side of the industry as well. And um, that's what I was doing while doing like the YouTube grind and, and networking. And then it was through that period of time that I went to Arizona and went to like the Pet Fest thing they had. And it was really cool to meet all these other creators and really see the potential and like turning this into a career and like compare where I was at, where they were at and see like the trajectory. And if I kept doing things right and how it was going. So it was right before COVID hit that I decided at the end of 2019, I was like, I'm going to do this full time, but I'm, there are a few things I have to do. Like one, I decided to leave Vancouver because I felt like financially it would be a lot more feasible um, yeah. just to like, really cut my living expenses down. And so I moved back to Ontario, which is where my family is. And I set myself up here and then things became complicated with COVID. But like at the same time, I can work from home, which is really wonderful. And and I've just, yeah, I've just been doing the grind since. And um, yeah, sorry, I, I don't know if that's just like a huge explanation, but it's kind of led to where I'm at now. And and I've just been so blessed and, and thankful that um for the receptivity for my content and and truly humbled by my audience. And I really, really strive to build this like humble and, and educational uplifting experience through the content I put out. So I, I should let you uh, say something. Yeah, no, no, that was, that was fantastic. That was great. And I can very much relate to sort of that experience because for most of my life, I was a competitive swimmer. I swam at a very high level till I was 24. That's when I retired from the sport mm-hmm. and that left like a huge hole in my life that I didn't really expect you sort of identify with that person. And then all of a sudden it's gone. And there goes like my purpose, my drive and everything. It was just disappeared. And like Dylan, the swimmer was now just Dylan. And it was like, what, what the hell is that? I have no clue. And so I know that exact, that sort of deep anxiety that can throw you into, especially if you're doing something. And I was just having a conversation the other day about this YouTube, especially reptile YouTube is a pretty weird thing for the regular person, right? They're like, Hey, what are you doing in your spare time? You're like, I make videos about lizards. They're like, thumbs up, man. Good job. (laughs) Hopefully that works out for you. And I know exactly that feeling where you're like, you put so much work into it and you, all your friends are becoming lawyers and doctors. And you're like, I'm doing this. I'm going to try to see if this works. And it can be pretty uncomfortable, especially at the beginning when you're literally doing it for free, Mm -hmm. essentially. And even if you're just making a little bit of money, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's a, it is a tough grind to get through that uh, sort of identity crisis in some ways. Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, like, I think f- to be more clear, part of the like feeling lost was not so much to do with the YouTube. Like that was something that like kind of helped me have a sense of purpose, but it was more so that I didn't know what I wanted to do next. But at the same right. time, I was still doing this to like, because I loved it and it was sort of like a level-headed thing, but I, I didn't feel like, it was really an option. I always saw it as just like a fun side gig hustle thing. Like, I mean, it wasn't, that makes it sound like I was trying to make money out of it, but no, like it was just like the side thing. And it was sure it was cool that it had a bit of uh, money to be gained from it, but it was like, just like a hobby almost or an expression of the hobby that I was doing anyways with my animals and everything. Um, But it was, it was the, the sense of purpose I gained from all of it was that was when I actually decided to turn that into like the job I have. And it, and it's such a blessed position to be in because don't get me wrong. Like I work so hard. I mean, my parents are always like, dude, like they don't say dude, but like you work like (laughs) you work like seven days a week. And I do often have to do that. And I, it's, it's a time management thing too. But for example, like I, I sometimes have sponsorships that they want the video a certain day. So I'm like, okay, well I did just post Friday but I have to post today because that's when they need the video for and things like that. Right. So sometimes it's planning it all, but if you have a bunch of other videos you're working out for your normal upload schedule, like, yeah, there's, there's different things. And then also to keep in mind that our subject material or they're, they're living beings. So you're not just like twice a week, like, let me record this and that's it. Like all the while you're maintaining and caring for your animals. So that yeah. is part of, the job and the experience too like and it's the most important job too like i always say like uh if 
if I, let's say, skip out on a day for like cleaning or something, I'm going to have to postpone my video or whatever. Right. Like I won't, I won't jeopardize the animals for any reason to post the video that never becomes yeah. more important. And I'm very appreciative that my audience is very understanding of that. Like there's a little joke sometimes that like when I fall off the upload schedule, they're like, okay, just say that Monday or Tuesday's video is coming out Wednesday because like I didn't post on Friday and they're like, it's going to backtrack you a bit, but I'll be like, no, no. And I try to like get back on but things like that happen too. But yeah it's, yeah, it's a, it's a hard grind. And I'm sure you know yourself, like it is a lot of work to organize and put together the videos and everything. So yeah, absolutely. So was there like, what, what was the moment where you were like, I'm going to try to do this? Was there something specific that happened or was it just kind of COVID and or was there like a story behind that? So everything that led to me making my decision to do it as a career was before COVID, funny enough. But like, okay, so, you know, I did mention that I considered teaching for a while and that was something that I changed my mind about like before even getting into the program that I got into, but I still always loved like teaching. And I do in the past, I've done a lot of volunteer service with like youth and other things. And just like, there's like a junior youth spiritual empowerment program that I did for a while, with, like community service and different things like that. So I love elements of teaching and empowering others. And, and so I thought it was really cool that this platform was creating a space to create a sense of community and positivity in the hobby. And I think that's something we need too. But then, like I said, I was going to just continue doing it as sort of a hobby experience or like a pastime. But when I started seeing the like monetization results and I started having a few companies approach me with sponsorship opportunities, like I could really be more systematic about this. And if I was able, or if I was in a situation where I could allocate most of my time to doing it really grinding hard, I could get it to that point. So I decided that moving back, I would dedicate myself or give myself a year to really just do this full time, work hard on it, like have no distractions and see where I'd be at at the end of that year. And the results were great. I mean, overall, it's definitely kind of scary for the first few months. And I will say there's so many things that I would have liked to have done that I couldn't do just with traveling. And I really wanted to be able to, um, show other members of our Canadian hobby, like community and what they do, right. And how they express and, and uh, partake in their passion and love for these animals. And I got to show a glimpse of what my goal is with that aspect through the tour I did at Canadian cold Bloods. I don't know if you had a chance yeah. to see that, yeah. but it's really fun. And the results are great too, for me, like as if career wise, like that video would perform so well, but then we went into lockdown after that and I didn't get to like, and so I would love the opportunity to be able to highlight more uh, hobbyists, whether they're in Canada or abroad. And um, yeah, so I mean, like, yeah, it's, 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 it's just been that that whole process was kind of interesting, but still I feel like the channel was doing well enough that I was like, okay, well, no, yeah, this is what I'm doing now. It was so great. It's such an honor to be able to do what you love as a career. And it's an interesting angle too, because you usually think most people that are, in the hobby um, as a career, they're like breeders or something like that, or they work at a zoo or vets. And this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, way of doing that, right? So, yeah, absolutely. Well, and it's, you know, you, if you ask any 12 year old right now what their dream job is, they're going to say YouTuber. You know, so it kind of has that connotation, but people don't realize how much work it is. And, and it's, so I'm so happy that it's working out so well for you, especially these last few years. YouTube has really blown up, especially on the reptile side. There's been some big names that have popped up. So yeah. it's great having a channel like yours, who is very, you know, has a good substance about it and you're doing things properly. And I think, I, like we talked about earlier, you're a great role model for the hobby as well, you know, doing the vet visits and documenting things properly and being honest. And one of the best, best things you do is like you had mentioned several times is you are not giving out written in stone instruction. You're mm. talking about your experience and really you're just sharing the hobby with the world, which is different than saying, here's the exact care sheet. Here's how you must do things. Mm -hmm. And that's where pet tubers run into trouble. I think is they become too, you know, they speak in, in, in too concrete terms. And I think you tend to avoid that. Yeah, I, I definitely think I do. And it's not to avoid like drama or anything. It's just, again, to make sure that it's coming from a position of like, like we're, we're all equal. And, and we're like, 
sure, I might have more experience than some people, but I also think that someone who has less experience, whether it's like a timeline or whatever, might come about or through their own experience of keeping it in, might learn something that I didn't know about. And so one of the exactly. other things that's cool about that sense of community is that I can learn a lot from my own audience. And that's something I've expressed to them. That's uh, something <laughs> Tazzle's really going to town. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's so, ripping around there. Yeah, it's so good to see. Um, but uh, yeah, like, I mean, I've shared with my audience that they've taught me a lot too. And that's something that's also super rewarding about it. Like, um, so yeah, I think when you navigate through that whole world with a sense of as much like humi- humility as possible and really express your passion that way, you can't really go wrong because you're still striving to do all the right things. And I always use like the Spider-Man analogy that, you know, with the great power comes great responsibility. It really is there. Whether I'm expressing myself as like my, what I do myself and, and not like, this is how it has to be. There's still that element of responsibility regardless. Like even if 10,000 people, 5,000 people watch that video, my goodness, you don't want to tell people like, this is what I'm doing. And it's like totally wrong. Right. Yeah. Like, and, but you also have to understand from their position, you should independently investigate the truth or whatever it is yourself too. Right. So there's, exactly. there's two sides to that as well, for sure. But um, yeah, I think when you go about it that way, it just, it is a lot more healthy, I think in general. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And so I, I do definitely appreciate that about the way you display and present the information. Uh, thanks so much. We've had a wonderful conversation here. I've really enjoyed this. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you wanted to mention or do we pretty much um, hit everything? I mean, I think we hit a lot of it. Like I I, I did want to quickly add, and I know I, I apologize, you know, you're asking me questions and I just go on a whole thing. I, That's I hope why I'm we have a it. podcast. <laughs> sure. I hope I'm giving you enough time to add your <laughs> comments, but thank you for- Uh, I I wanted to say, like, I mean, just to add, like, yeah, I I think going forward with the channel, like, I I am really hoping that, um, you know, pandemic and COVID, like, relating or or, uh, permitting, I should say, that, uh, yeah, I'll be able to do a lot more, uh, I guess, content that involves traveling around and and, uh, showing other hobbyists experience, because, again, like the emphasis on community building is so important. And I know that it's a very intimate thing. And maybe also with businesses, like not everyone wants to show what they're doing. But for those that do, I think it really helps to build a sense of a community and show that we are there and present and growing. Because with a lot of the things going on with the hobby being under attack, I think it would be really helpful to grow the visual, like, experience and representation of what it is we're doing and show it as like a wholesome and really educational and encouraging enriching thing you know so people see the really positive side i really it's sad that there's so many popular documentaries and other things that show this negative side of specialty pets we'll say but yeah like just to have a platform and to be able to use it for important things and you know, it's a financial constraint, but I hope that as things progress, I'll be able to do more traveling and maybe even show some of the conservation endeavors that are going on where some of these animals are from. Like my dream would be to visit Madagascar and, and somehow use my platform, excuse me, my platform to uh, maybe showcase some of the initiatives that are going on there for reforestation and conservation and and it might be beneficial to show how the animals are kept in the wild. Like, those are dreams I have. So we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, but like, I'm, I'm happy that I've been able to do this much good. It's very humbling just from being stuck in my reptile room during the pandemic. It's already really encouraging. So I'm eager to uh, share with the world more cool things as, as things get better with that. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the idea of presenting the image of herpetoculture to the mainstream public as a or to the non-reptile keeping public as this dynamic group of people who's worried about conservation and concerned about proper breeding and ethical keeping and high standards of welfare and all these things is what we need more of we like you already said there's plenty of bad press out there there's even members within herpetoculture that give bad press by just the way they keep and the way that's out there so mm-hmm. the more people we can have like yourself the better and i, I think that is what will save 
reptile keeping in general. And I love that you have this vision because I think you'll go after it and I think you're going to do it. So there's some seriously great future plans that you have and looking forward to that. Can you let everybody know if they don't already know where you can be found online? Uh, yeah, for sure. And thank you again, Dylan. It was really a pleasure. Uh, yeah, so you guys can obviously find me at Reptiliatis on not only YouTube, but Instagram, Facebook. I'm also on Twitter, but I'll be honest, I don't post there much. Uh, and then also TikTok. So, Awesome. Yeah. Well, Dion, thank you so much for this. I love this conversation. I know the listeners will enjoy it as well. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to be a guest on your uh, channel. All right. That is the end of that episode. Dion, thank you so much for being so generous with all your time. We, I think we spent like probably another hour talking after the podcast. So I really appreciate that as well. Listeners, I'm sure you enjoyed that podcast, but if you did, make sure you let us know in the YouTube comments or come comment on the posts on Instagram as well. If you're listening to this on audio, we would really appreciate that. And please feel free to share it on Instagram, Facebook, and whatnot. That always helps find more eyes and ears to listen and watch the show. Again, head to animalsathomenetwork.com if you're looking for more information on this episode or any other episode that you can find on the Animals at Home Network. Thank you very much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Again, affiliate links are both in the show notes as well as the YouTube description. And finally, you can find a link to the Patreon account on both the show notes and the YouTube description if you want to join us there. And I think that's it. Thank you guys so much for listening this week, and I will catch you next week.